let's unshackle our thinking and think like God does. to share with you today a powerful message called the power of change the power of change are you ready this morning are you ready turn with me to Philippians chapter 3 and we're going to read several verses there that the Apostle Paul penned by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 through verse 14 Give you just a moment to turn there, find it in your Bible, and then we will read this text from which we will then teach on this message called The Power of Change. All right, Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now there are many, many things that could be taken out of these words of Scripture, but I want to really generalize it and and then go farther into the teaching that we want to do today with other texts. But I just want to show you the spirit and attitude of Paul from these verses. An attitude that I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. And I'm going to press on to get there. I don't act and I don't feel like and I'm not satisfied with where I'm living in the reality of what Jesus has done for me and His plan for my life and the things that He has destined me for. I'm not satisfied with where I am today. I have a hunger to press on. And that hunger from the Apostle Paul speaks to me of his willingness to change. The emphasis in Scripture on repentance, repentance and the many teachings of Scripture show the need for people to embrace change. The word repentance at its best uh, um, definition really just simply means a different way of thinking or a turnaround. Well, if you're going to turn around, that's a change. And when Jesus came saying you need to repent and the apostles preached a message of repentance, they were saying you're going to have to think differently than you used to. You used to rely on the law. You used to rely on a certain way, on rituals. Now you're going to have to change and think in line with Jesus. Hallelujah. That's a big change. And most of the people in the day of Jesus walking on this earth and introducing the new covenant, introducing God through Jesus Christ, could not accept it because they couldn't repent or change. It's not much different today. People still struggle with the change of relying totally on Jesus Christ for their life and eternity, for their salvation. People still will say very commonly, I believe I'm going to be okay because I'm a good person. I think I'll make it to heaven because I'm trying the best that I can. A person like that needs to repent. 
needs to change from reliance on what they have done or are doing and totally put their faith in Jesus Christ. For he who believes on Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John in the epistles of John said, These things are written that those of us who believe on the name of Jesus Christ can know that we have eternal life. Aren't you glad we can know? Well, it takes a shift. It takes repentance. Somebody says, well, what is repentance? Repentance at the level of receiving salvation is that you turn. You turn from your self-reliance. You turn from your own ability and your own righteousness. You don't want to be found with your own righteousness. You want to be found with the righteousness that is from Him. I want to be found in Him. That's a turn. That's a change. That's repentance. So the very idea of repentance, the instructions of Scripture make it very clear that God never meant for us to be static or stuck in the past, but rather to change from glory to glory and from faith to faith. The call of God is an upward call, not a downward call or even a horizontal call, but a call that is calling us up to a higher place, greater things, walking in greater things that He has provided than ever before. Why don't you just say it with me? I'm going up. I'm going up. I'm not going to resist change. I'm going to repent. Come to God on the basis of Jesus Christ. Rely on Him wholly and completely and receive eternal life. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. How we handle change has a great deal to do with how a person progresses or regresses. It's not possible to be static. You, 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 th- this life is, is either pulling you down or you are aggressively going after what God has intended for you and you're going up. And so how we handle change has so much to do with whether we progress or regress. Famous person you may have heard of before, Winston Churchill, said to improve is to change. To be perfect is to change often. (laughs) I think he was pretty right. To, To improve is to change. To be perfect is to change often. You don't need me to tell you this probably, but I will anyway. There are three main reasons for change or causes of change. Number one is things are just changing around us. We live in a different world than we did 10, 20, 30, 40, 60. You go on down down in history if you want to. We live in a different world today, not because you necessarily wanted to change, just because... The world has changed. Things have changed. And it forces change because the environment we live in, we, time just changes things. Secondly, people change because the pain of staying the same or the discomfort of staying the same is greater than the discomfort of changing. When, I'll give you an example, Um, you know, a lot of times people will say things like, uh, you know, I I got sick. I got sick and and then you hear them usually kind of in the next breath pretty soon saying something like, we really changed our lifestyle. We really changed our diet. We changed our lifestyle. We changed this because the pain, the suffering of the sickness is greater 
than the discomfort of the change. And so the third kind of change, and that's the one I really want to zero in on today, is people change because they have a desire and a hunger to move forward and progress and become greater, walk in greater things, walk in more of what God has for them, walk more fully in those things. That's the best kind of change is when we initiate the change because of the hunger and the desire in our life. I mean, I'll, I can almost guarantee you that every person that I just talked about who changed their diet, changed their habits when they got sick or had to recover from something would probably also say, I wish I had changed before. Every person who is breathing has the opportunity to not wish they had changed before, but can change today at will. Don't wait until the environment makes you change or the pain makes you change. Go ahead and change because you see it in His Word, see it in, in, in your attitude, you see it in your desire, and you want to go from glory to glory. You want to go to the levels God has for you. If you want to be a manager, you're going to have to change to start thinking like a manager while you're still a laborer. If you want to be a CEO and a business owner, you're going to have to change your thinking. You can't run a business thinking like somebody who is, who is just operating on an hourly basis and isn't thinking like a CEO. Somebody says, well, if I ever got it, I could do it. No, you couldn't. You have to change before you get there. So many people are stuck in ruts of the past and what they have experienced that they are not walking in what they really were destined to walk in. Let's go to the children of Israel. If you have your Bibles there in front of you, you can turn to Exodus chapter 2. It's amazing what turmoil, pain, and hurt can cause people to do in wanting change for the better. I'm telling you, there's a higher way. There's a better way. And that is seeing what God wants before the discomfort, before the pain, and deciding to change before we groan under the pain and want to change then. But this is the first. As the children of Israel, God has a plan for them to bring them out of Egypt, to bring them out of that slavery, and take them to a promised land. The promised land is where God wants them. The promised land is where God wants you. 
He has a plan. He has a place for all of us, a promised land for us. He has the job. He has the career. He has the place in Christ. He has the fulfillment of your life. He has a place, a promised land for all of us. But to get this group, this nation, this children of Israel in slavery from there to the promised land is going to take some serious change. <laughs> it's going to take some serious change because God doesn't have in mind for them to be slaves in the promised land. So the first change, of course, that they experienced, it says God heard that cry and God brought them out by a great deliverance. Glory be to God. God can bring us out if we will cry out to Him. Thank God. God is a deliverer of those who cry out to Him. Thank God that in the pain, if we cry out and want to change, God will help us bring us out. They come out by a great miraculous work of God and the next thing we know, we see them at Mount Sinai. You remember the story? They're at Mount Sinai and God is... God's presence is on the mountain. They are there. They are there before the presence of God and the, and the invitation of God is, hear my voice, hear me speak. I want to speak to them. And the children of Israel say, no, we don't want to talk to God. Moses, you go up and talk to Him and then come back and talk to us. They had a difficulty changing. In Exodus 32, let's read from there. This is at Mount Sinai now. Exodus chapter 32, 1 through 4. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses... The man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. And so all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Can you imagine? God brought them out of bondage, parted the sea for them so they could pass through on dry ground. And now they're in the presence of God on the mountain. Moses, their leader, disappears into the glory, into the cloud, and they get tired of waiting for him. And they say to Aaron, hey, make us a God. Aaron, of course, the great leader that he was, <laughs> said, hey, give me the earrings. Strip your gold off and, you know, imagine God had blessed them with that gold. Remember, they were slaves. They didn't have gold. And God, it says, He brought them out with abundance. They came out of there. The Egyptians were so in fear that they handed them everything. I mean, they were handing them their wallets, their purses. They were like, here, take this. Man, I mean gold. Here, you can have it. I mean, they were in fear of, of the Israelites and, and their God. And I mean, they're, they're marching out of there and the Egyptians are just handing them stuff. You know, here, take the gold. And so here they come out of there with a mighty deliverance. There was not one feeble one among them. They come out of there with gold and silver, and then they get in the presence of God and want to make a God 
out of the things He has blessed them with. (laughs) They build a calf out of their jewelry. Can you imagine? And then they look to the very things, make that calf, you know, and later Aaron tells Moses, and he says, (laughs) we we pitched our jewelry in the fire, and a calf came out. (laughs) Now Aaron is even lying about it. We, we threw our jewel in the fire. Out came this calf. Why did the children of Israel and Aaron make a golden calf and worship it in the manner that they did? The God of Egypt was a cow. And they had seen back in Egypt this kind of worship and this kind of activity. And when they got in the presence of God and heard the upward call, they went back to what they had seen. They couldn't imagine that God would speak out of the cloud. That there was a change they had to embrace. And they went back to what they had seen and were familiar with, and had seen, you know, when the Egyptians worship, they have a calf, they have a a cow. This is what they do. This is what they do. They, They worship like this, and they began to go back to what they had seen. The greatest hindrance to embracing God's change in our life is what we have seen behind us. You can live the life God has prepared for you. You can enter into the promised land. You can have a mindset change in your life. You can come into everything that God has for you without just looking back and embracing what was there. Embrace what is in front of you and go for the change that God has in your life. You don't have to be an, an, an abuser of substance because your family has had it for five generations. You don't have to be a person who succumbs to detrimental anger in your life just because you had a culture of it in your past. You don't have to live with hereditary diseases. They may say you have to, but let God bring the change. This has just been in our family for generations. Who said you can't break it? Who said that you're not up for change? Look to what God has for you. And then finally, turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, and this is the kind of real change that God wanted the children of Israel to and us also to embrace. This is where they finally came to a place of change as God wanted them to embrace it. And that is they went in to possess the promised land. With Joshua leading them, they embraced the change that would allow them to possess that promised land and prepared themselves for the things they had never seen before. Glory, hallelujah. Joshua chapter 1, verse verse 10 and 11. Now, Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over. Notice three days, the resurrection. For within three days you will cross over this Jordan. Go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Then jump down to chapter 3, Joshua 3, verse 5 and 6. Joshua 3, verse 5 and 6. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow 
the Lord will do wonders among you. Hallelujah. I would say that to you today. Sanctify yourselves. That means prepare yourself. Set yourself apart because tomorrow God's going to do things you've never seen before. Then verse 6 says, Then Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Joshua, now the leader, designed by God to take them into the promised land, tells them, prepare yourself for things tomorrow you've never seen. And were they ever in for a surprise? They had never seen priests take the ark and walk into a river and the river open up for all of them to pass through. Glory, hallelujah. Ah. You may have never seen your father pray with you, but that doesn't mean you can't and see the miraculous work of God in your family. You see, people are living with what they've seen. Why Jesus even declared himself to be the agent of change. Yeah, you remember the scripture, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What? To set the captives free. To break the bonds of captivity. To make the, cause the blind to see. That's an agent of change, isn't it? He's going to take darkness and make it light. Take bondage and make it liberty. Cause blindness to become sight. Jesus is the one who brings change to our life. And we can expect it even today. That sickness leaves our bodies. And the things the enemy has done to change in our life because Jesus came to bring light to darkness. Life to death and destroy the works of the devil once and for all. He is our supreme agent of change. Embrace Him and allow Him to change your life. Embrace Him and allow Him to bring light. Embrace Him and receive the life that He can bring. Embrace His promises and be healed in the name of Jesus. Embrace His promises and come out of darkness into His marvelous light. Embrace Him and come out of the oppression into the light and glorious liberty of Jesus Christ. He is our change.